What marvel has captured the imagination of visitors to Karakoram from the 13th century on? We'll discuss that today on Footnoting History. Hello, this is Nicole, and welcome to the February 9th episode of Footnoting History because the best stories are always in the footnotes. This morning, we'll be answering the question, what was a French silversmith doing in the Mongol capital of Karakoram? When they think of the Mongols, most people think of savage nomads who swept across Eurasia, destroying everything in their path. It's a well-deserved status that they consciously cultivated. This reputation for brutality helped the Mongols militarily. The Mongols wanted to make sure that everyone knew that resistance was futile. Genghis Khan's policy, as well as that of his successors, was to kill everyone who tried to fight back against the Mongols, along with their entire families, men, women, and children. For example, after Mongol envoys were killed and mutilated in the Central Asian Kingdom of Khwarezm, the Mongols raised its cities, enslaved its women and craftsmen, and executed its soldiers group by group. However, the worst fate was reserved for unskilled civilians, who the Mongols used as human shields in their attacks on subsequent cities, and even to fill up the moats surrounding these cities. If you were a skilled craftsman in Khwarezm, or other places that the Mongols conquered, your fate was a little better. Chances are, you would be conscripted and sent by the Mongols to wherever they thought you would be useful. One such artisan, Guillaume Boucher, a silversmith from France, was captured in Hungary and sent across Eurasia to the Mongol capital of Karakoram. The Mongol Khan Mangu had Guillaume build a magnificent silver fountain in the courtyard of his palace in the shape of a great tree with lions at its roots. A conduit pipe ran through each of the lions in order to spew forth white mare's milk. This might sound strange to us, but Arig, or fermented mare's milk, remains to this day the traditional national drink of Mongolia, and it plays an important part in hospitality there. Getting back to Guillaume's amazing silver tree, four more conduit pipes went up to the main branches, which were bent downward, and each of which had a gilded serpent on it, its tail coiling around the silver tree. Each of the four branches issued forth a different type of alcoholic beverage. Wine flowed from the first, Karakosmos, or clarified mare's milk, from a second, Ball, a honey-based drink, from the third, and Teresina, a rice ale, from the fourth. At the top of the tree, between the four conduit pipes, Guillaume constructed an angel holding a trumpet, which had pipes leading up to it as well, but, as we'll see, for a different purpose. The drinks themselves were stored in a cellar outside of the palace where servants poured them into the proper conduit pipe when the angel blew his trumpet. How did they get the angel to blow his trumpet? Well, there was, of course, another servant concealed in a vault under the tree who blew into the pipe leading to the angel to make the trumpet sound when the Khan's head butler called for a drink. The butlers would then go and retrieve the drinks from the fountain and bring them to the guests in the palace. We know about Guillaume and his elaborate fountain from the account of the Franciscan monk, William of Rubeck, who went to Karakoram in the 1250s as part of a papal diplomatic envoy sent to try and enlist the aid of the Mongol Khan for a crusade against the Muslims. Although he was the first European to give an eyewitness account of the Mongol capital, he was clearly not the first European in Karakoram. During his stay, he encountered Guillaume, who, in addition to the Khan's fountain, made William of Rubeck a waffle iron of sorts to make communion wafers, as well as other religious objects. Willie reports that Guillaume invited him to his house, where Guillaume's wife and friend, also captured in Hungary, dined with them. A number of skilled laborers from the reaches of the Mongol Empire, which spanned from Eastern Europe to China in the 13th and 14th century, were relocated to Karakoram and elsewhere. In the capital itself, archaeologists have dug up pieces of imported Chinese silk, high-quality ceramics, including Chinese porcelain, and decorative metal objects, which all showed the vitality and cosmopolitan nature of the city. 
Sadly, today there is no trace of Guillaume's fountain, although William's description inspired French artists to draw what they thought it would look like. The image of the fountain has remained in Mongolian memory, as one such drawing is now on the back of some Mongolian currency, and one Karakora motel even has a replica of the fountain in its parking lot. In fact, little remains of the marvels of 13th century Karakoram, which was full of artisans from all over the empire, Muslim and Chinese merchants, and places of worship from Buddhist temples to mosques to churches. Although they were fierce fighters and conscripted people to come and build them the finer things in life, the Mongols were open to and even supported various religious traditions in the capital and beyond as long as they did not stir up political opposition. In fact, archaeologists have uncovered the remains of a large Buddhist temple active in this period. One of the few objects still standing in Karakoram is a large stone tortoise. Although the fountain is no longer extant, one can still travel to Mongolia. It is still possible to buy some arik, perhaps with a 5,000 Tugrik bill, which has the image of the fountain on it and reflect on how the Mongols also enjoyed the finer things in life, in addition to being the ferocious fighters that we all know. This has been Footnoting History. If you liked our podcast, remember to check us out on the web at footnotinghistory.weebly.com, where you can find links to our Facebook page and Twitter feed, as well as information on upcoming podcasts. Join us next week, when we'll be talking about Henry II and the accidental invasion of Ireland. Until then, remember the best stories are always in the footnotes. See you next week!